So is this Kemper player a Vorsprung Dirk Technik or is he done all the Tonex simulator? Ah, so here we are in Evil Owl Studios. I've got Alan Bruce with me, the bass man. The bass. He likes fishing. And uh, yeah, we've got this thing here. This is a, one of them Kemper things. Now, if you don't know much about Kemper things, don't worry about it, because we're going to tell you. In fact, in this video, you are going to see more about this product than any other video that's out there. Maybe even I'll be showing you things that maybe Mr. Kemper and his colleagues don't want me to show. Or not. Who knows? Do you know? I don't know. He doesn't know, and to be honest, I don't know either. But in any case, there it is. The Kemper player arrived directly from Germany. And more about that later and the prices. Oh, wait until you hear that. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is flop it out. Well, let's face it. At the moment, we've only got a box. Well, we've got a box, but you know, we, we might you've not got, have to, a got to do the thing. We've got a box allegedly with a camper. He's had the money right. That's all I've got to say. Well, here we go. It's a nice colour, isn't it? What do you think? It's a lovely colour. It's a nice colour. It's a sort of camper green and a splash of orange. I like orange, don't you? Anyway, what do you get in the box? Well, you get that thing there. It's pretty heavy too, but we'll come back to all of those sort of questions and things later. You get a power supply which we'll also come to. Always handy. Four feet. And we get a Kemper Profiler player, manual. Or is that a manual? Or well, whichever's manual. which. It's very small. It's all the download stuffers you've grown to expect. And uh, yeah, what more can you say about that? Okay, well, some people might know who come to my channel uh, they might know that I've had a, a bit of a history with Kemper over the years. In fact, my first foray into the Kemper product was January 2012. Yeah, so 12 years ago, I bought a Kemper, well, simulator, we'll call it that. You can call it what you like. It was like an old woman's handbag, and they still are today, which is part of a bit of a weird thing. And uh, it's one of the things I want to cover in this completely in-depth review about Kemper. Some people might say, oh, Tony, he doesn't, he doesn't like Kemper. But of course, if you go back and have a look down in the text below, you will see that very first video that I actually made. And I made it with a, with a friend that uh, used to be in a band I was in uh, a long time ago. Yeah, Dan Kelly. Dan Kelly, where are you? Well, I do know where he is, as it happens. Last time I spoke to him, he's in Jersey. Playing a gig. Yeah, he does things like that. He does gigs too. But I'm not going to loan this to him because he's one of them bass types. <laughs> you know what they like? You know, eight strings and don't know what to do with them. I, yeah? No. So that Kemper, uh, at the time, when I, I did the review on it, I was absolutely amazed. There had never been any product like the Kemper... Uh, Amp, I'll call it that, although it wasn't powered at the time. There's a story to that too, which Mr. Christoph Kemper would be, well, happy to forget, but sadly, I'm one of the people that bought the product without an amp. Yeah, what a story. So, scarily, since that day, back in uh, January 2012, I've had a Kemper. And I have to admit, I did get rid of the uh, the geek sandbag, I think that's what they called it, actually. I got rid of that and I bought the rack because, well, the rack's a more professional sort of thing and the geek sandbag makes you look a bit of an idiot, if you want the truth. Whoever designed it, well, they might have been on another planet. This is more what I'd have expected back in 2012, but it isn't what I got. I only got this now, literally, today. This is coming from Germany, by the way, not from some of the local dealers. More about them later, too. OK, so the first thing that I think we should do is uh, whip the lid off this uh, this player, this Kemper player, and have a look what it's actually made of. Because, to be honest, 
If it's made of uh, technology from 2012, it doesn't sound good. Technology is something that moves forward at an alarming rate. And even in the sector of business that I actually still work in, you know, you can run out of uh, <laughs> product because some of the components that were in the product become obsolete. And then you've got to redesign and, well, use more current chips. And I doubt for one second that, you know, 12-year-old chips are going to be I'm very much of a longevity, really. So let's get down and have a look right off at what's inside this unit. I can't wait, can you? What about you? I can't wait. He can't wait either. Eager. Yeah, he's eager. Okay, well, here we are for the very first time you've ever seen inside a camper player. And what we've got at the moment... It, this uh, unit's like a, a sort of clamshell design, and this is the top half. On the other side of this is all the uh, various pots and controls that you'd normally see as an ordinary user. But here we are on the inside. We've got this one little connector that connects to the main board, and apart from that, you can slip this apart quite easily. It comprises of one, two, three and a fourth board down there at the bottom. So there are at least four boards. But the fact is that this is really just a, a method of controlling the other portion of the uh, pedal, really. You can see that the quality, well, from where you are, you can see the quality is actually pretty good. However, I can see also the pots on the side down here You'll see a quick picture on the screen right now of those pots. Uh, they're sort of, sort, well, sort of relative like Marshall pots, in my opinion, give or take. You've got a, a bit in the middle there. If you can see that, uh, that's the bit that lights up from a lead on the PCB. And apart from that, as I said, you've got your four layers. This bottom layer handles the, uh, the push buttons, and those are a, a pretty novel sort of... Uh, layout for push buttons, not like the very old-fashioned click-click or armor buttons. These have been, uh, been well, really brought more up-to-date than anything else, and uh, yeah, very nice they are. So, as far as this side of the uh, the unit's concerned, it's, uh, yeah, very good, very nice. Uh, I dare say that, you know, you might have a bit of trouble with it at some stage, who can say, but it's a double-sided PCB or multi, might even be multi-layered, but I doubt it. It's probably double-sided. And, uh, yeah, very impressive indeed. But Kemper always was. And you've got to bear in mind, it's a, it's a German... Uh, well, they claim it's a German manufacturer. Whether it is or it isn't is another story. I, I've been looking avidly for the Made in China logos or Made in Korea or philippines or 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 and I, I currently i can't find them but uh, that might change or might not as we go through the review anyway enough of this piece for now we'll be coming back to this later and i'm going to go and have a look at the uh, the main pcb here we are for the first time having a look inside the camper player and its uh, chips and everything else that goes with it as well as the quality of course bearing in mind that it's claimed to be a german uh, product it may well be or not I'll try and find out. But let's start where we mean to continue. If you look in here, there is a little daughter board, which reminds me a lot of, uh, to be honest, of the old camper, which had uh, chips mounted on a little daughter board in a similar sort of fashion. And I always felt that that was so that maybe they could upgrade the product at some stage and, uh, you know, uh, keep it current, so to speak. Now, that might be true or it might not be true. Kemper doesn't tell me anything. I'm just a simple customer. Yeah, that's the way life is. So the first chip, this big one here, is a, a chip that sort of been around. Uh, this is called an NXP LPC4337. Uh, yeah, with 256 in, in it. It's probably got some volatile memory that we can do things with. I'm moving along a little bit to this one here, again, maybe a different uh, brand of chip, but very similar to what you see in a lot of these products. This is uh, made by Alliance, it's a memory chip, and it's an AS4C8M16SA-70CN. 
More about these chips later on, by the way. Uh, we just have a quick run through them right now and uh, go from there. Yeah, all very interesting. Now, down across here, we've got another chip right there, which is uh, a QL7935. And uh, yeah, we'll look at that a bit later as well. That's an interesting enough chip. Uh, there's an ISSI chip there, right down there. And that's an IS25LP2560. And lastly, of course, over here, we've got our friend Cirrus Logic from back in the PC days. That they, they were originally based in Richardson in Texas near Dallas, in case you didn't know. And uh, yeah, I've been to Richardson quite a few times uh, over the last 25 years. Very interesting. But this one, this Cirrus Logic, it's probably something to do with A to D or D to A. Usually they are. And this one's a CS42438-CMZ, which we'll take a look at also a bit later on. Now, before we do move on, because I want to go a little bit further with this device, because it's not showing you all the chips from our current position, we'll be going a little bit closer, or pulling things apart. But I just wanted to cover these other components across here in the I.O. And the first thing to notice uh, that, that nobody told me about is, oh, it's got an internal battery. Yeah, it sure has. And uh, when that battery, well, sooner or later will go belly up or fail or do whatever it is it does, this unit will lose all its, probably lose all its parameters. So you've got to change the battery so it can keep the parameters that you put in it. That's fair enough. But it would have been fair enough uh, had they told you that there's one in there, I think. Now looking at the rest along here, what we've got is we've got uh, some various ports. But I want you to draw your attention to these here in particular. Because you can see these are ports that are made of plastic primarily. And they are soldered onto the main board. And if you can just see just down there, just down there, the input side of these ports is also plastic now you'll see on a lot of rolling gear for example that this outside part is metal on this one i can hear it it's plastic so do bear in mind that if these get huge amounts of stick well maybe you could have problems with the plastic and so on and so forth or not i'm not guaranteeing they'll fail i'm just telling you that it's plastic do remember if there's any sort of heat that ever got uh, in this way, well, I guess out this way, uh, that might not be helpful. I can't really see it doing that, but who knows? Who knows what some of you guys get up to? <laughs> now, other than that, I want to just have a quick comment about the rest of the board, because to me, it all looks very nice. You can tell it's made on a... Uh, it's made on a machine. There's no ifs or buts about that. And later on, if it does fail, of course, if you're no good at soldering that sort of stuff with surface mount technology, and you've got the uh, the heat plate to get the thing warm and the uh, the magnifying glass so you can actually see the component, well, if you haven't got any of that, well, good luck to you. I also noticed down here, just before we move on, that you've got two sets of connections there that are just there and not talked about. Maybe there are other things coming for this unit at some stage. Who knows? They don't tell me. In fact, I think they probably would never tell me. <laughs> Let's move on and have a look at the rest. Sneakily, round the bottom of the board, you've got this DSP processor, which is a, uh, a DSP 856720AG chip. There he is. And you've got this... Uh, this is an Alliance chip again, right there, which is a memory chip, just like it was on the other side of the board. Yeah, all very nice. And down here, uh, this little unit here, actually, is made in another country. And that's uh, what they call an Espress IF. Not Express, an Espress IF. And it's an ESP32-WR-OVER-E. It's either... I don't know, either Bluetooth or wireless, or well, maybe both even. Who knows, but we'll be looking at those a bit later on. Now, as you look on this side of the board, you can see uh, that, it, once again, it's made on a machine. 
because this is the other side of the main board. But you've still got these sort of interface connections there and there. And there's one over there as well. You can see there's three sort of areas of uh, interest if you've got an interest in that. But uh, I, I can't see what those are for and nobody's really going to tell me. But uh, there's your look at underneath the, uh, the main processing board and the DSP chip and all the couple of bits and pieces that are hidden under there. So what I would say is that, uh, yeah, it's very nice quality. There's no getting away from that. It's made, well, if it, if it didn't say Kemper on it, it might say Roland on it, <laughs> I have to say. And uh, yeah, not much more you can say, except that uh, as a cost, uh, a value, if you will, it's probably worth the money. Should work for a long time until you have battery troubles and then it will stop. Or just lose all the information that you load up onto it and then you've got to change the battery. Or somebody has. Yeah. So I'm going to put this back together now and then we'll go back up top and have a look at the controls. Isn't it exciting? Well, I think so. What do you think, Al? Yeah, definitely exciting. He thinks it's exciting too. And he's a bass guy. I mean, what can I say? Okay, well, here we are. What we're going to do first off is uh, plug her in. Plug her in, Al. That's it. Fabulous. This is what you get when you fire it up. Yeah, it's all impressive, isn't it? And just think, it still works after Tony's been at it. There it is. Oh, it's all on. It's got nice cord lights, different cord lights, all very nice. And, uh, yeah, it's aesthetically pleasing, as some people would say, especially if you're in the government. They use words like that. Me, I think it looks okay, don't you? Yeah. That's normal words, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, let's have a look at the top of it, and we can move forward on that basis. Right, these buttons across the bottom are the ones you press to get different things out of it. You've got button one, button two, and button three. And they're called one, two, and three, which they would, which is obvious. Number one is for the previous rig. It steps leftwards through the rigs and banks. Number two is an effect button. It toggles and assign effect or effects on or off, and more about them later. And number three takes you to the next rig. Okay, well, next in line is a thing called the bank button. There it is. Yeah. It's got a little blue light over it at the moment. That steps through the rig banks. Each bank has got a dedicated colour. Yeah, all interesting. And the next item, ring button 1 to 5, here they are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and yeah, I can count. You press to load one of the five rigs within the current bank. So you've got banks up and down, and then you've got five rigs per bank. And you hold it in to initiate the storage uh, uh, area. All nice and simple. Okay, we've also got uh, an input LED. There it is, for when you've got input. That makes sense, doesn't it? And we've also got a tap tuner button. Yeah, there it is. At this end, you can see that. Not difficult to understand. You tap it repeatedly to trigger the tap tempo and hold to activate the tuner. Yeah, I guess it'll zoom across this bit here, well this bit down here, there they are, in tune and out of tune. I'm out of tune more than I'm in tune, everybody tells me, but don't worry about that. Next up we've got a, a gain uh, knob, we'll call it that, and a bass, middle and treble, which is really like an EQ. We've even got a rig volume over there, look, which you can see. Oh, and a little Bluetooth sign. Oh, one thing on that gain knob, if you push it in and dial, at the same time, that controls a noise gate uh, for the gain bit. Yeah, if you get me. And on this uh, this rig volume, you've got a similar thing that was going on with the gain noise gate. If you press it in and turn this knob, basically it can adjust the uh, the Bluetooth volume as well as volume of your USB playback if it's going through a door. Boringly, we've got a, a master volume that controls, well, the master volume. Controls the volume of analog outputs collectively and globally, not stored per rig, by the way. That is it, that's turn it on and turn it off mode. 
if you will. Now you've also got uh, a section called FX1 and FX2. They're up here at the top. You can see them. There they are. All very nice. Well, they affect the controls and can be assigned per rig. The lead colour indicates the category of assigned effect, and the buttons switch the effect on and off, if you get me. Each knob controls up to two effect parameters, and you can dial while pushing to access the second parameter. So once again, you've got to do this push in and turn, which is a little bit fiddly in my view, but there you go, it, it is a dual purpose knob. This button up here, this cone, no, it's not an ice cream cone as you might think. <laughs> I know it's got little things around it that could be construed as a, an ice cream cone, but sadly, in this case, it's not. You use that to uh, connect to a, a Kemper cone cab, and that's that. Oh, you haven't got one? Well, don't worry yourself. And right next to it there is this uh, Bluetooth logo. There it is. And you press this to activate the Bluetooth for audio transmissions, and it, it turns into blue uh, when it's doing audio transmissions. But if you hold it down, it'll activate Wi-Fi, and it turns green. Uh, you can scan a QR code that's provided uh, with a smartphone or tablet to connect it and use the Kemper Rig Manager for the iOS or Android uh, OS, which is very nice. And the colour becomes violet. That means that Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are both ac active in this uh, little lighting up control knob. How exciting. So quite good that you can connect to it with wireless and quite good that you can connect to it with Bluetooth. Yeah, it's good all round really, isn't it? Well, there's little else to show you on the top here, except that you get this nice light, lighted up uh, Kemper logo. Yeah, he thinks he's Tesla, Luke, somehow, doesn't he? What do you think? Do you think he's Tesla, Bruce? No. You don't? I don't know, it's, it's a sort of Tesla type of... <laughs> Ignore me, most do. <laughs> Who said that? I don't know. Let's go and have a look at the I.O. Okay, here we are around the back, and uh, as you can see there, that's where you put your guitar in. We've got a couple of outputs here, a left and a right output for monitoring. We've got a set of headphones connector, which is in stereo, by the way. I can confirm that. And we've got a, a sort of uh, pedal socket, so we can uh, vary different parameters. Let's call it that for now. Further along, this is the main output, but of course the main output is in mono, whereas this monitoring's in stereo, and I know the headphones are in stereo, but the main output's mono. Moving along from that, we've got two connections. We've got a uh, USB. One is used for the door, uh, from what I believe, and the other one's used for other things, maybe updating from PC and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we've got a Kensington lock cut out there. I believe that's what that is, although he doesn't tell you what it is. And the power supply, interestingly, is between 9 and 12 volts DC. It's 24 watt, but importantly, it's positive on the outside and negative on the inside, which makes it Rowan compatible, which I always think is important. Sadly, this unit has no on and off control. And it's an item being left out more and more and more. And uh, they're all supposed to be green and doing all this stuff about saving power and all the rest. And here's the unit where you can't turn the power off if you forget. There's no button to press, let's put it that way. There's no auto on and off, I doubt. There might be, but we'll see later on. Yeah, so that's round the back. Hope that was interesting. Okay, just before we move on, uh, let's have a look at the power supply. It is included. It comes with three separate uh, types of connectors. You see a picture on the screen now. It all looks very interesting stuff. And it's uh, this particular one's made by Intertech in China. It's a Chinese power supply. And it's, uh, it's an input of 100 to 240 volts, so it's a switch mode power supply. It's uh, 9 volts output, as I said, and it's a 2.5 amp, 22.5 uh, watt power supply. Yeah, 
Interestingly, it's got the UK CA mark on it, which uh, hasn't actually been implemented. <laughs> so that's the power supply. I'm not too worried about the power supply, as it happens. Some power supplies are really bad. But this one, I have to say, is quite good. So good marks on that. Good marks for Intertech, even if it is made in China. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, all so good so far. And strangely enough, even though I've had it apart, it's still working. And I've got some other good news for you as well. It's actually working on a, uh, a Roland Boss power supply, which I think is better than theirs. Hmm. No, don't hold it against them. <laughs> They're probably all made in China. What do you think? Probably. He thinks so too. Okay, just briefly, I want to talk about those chips that we saw inside the unit and uh, you know what, what they are and roughly what they do sort of so to speak like the, the Cirrus logic and the uh, the DSP chips and stuff like that I don't think there's anything hyper special in the chips and things that I saw at least except the qualities there uh, but we, we'll just cover those chips briefly as I always do and uh, I think it's important so here's the section on chips so, Mr. Bruce has gone home for the night. He's like that. Base guys, you know. But I'm still here, and uh, we're going to talk specifically about the chips inside the Kemper player uh, that are used, and one or two other things, I think, just as well. And, uh, yeah, I've already been through it all. You've probably seen the chips earlier on, but you don't really know much about them. Most people don't. But what's actually important is the, is the chips and the power of the chips and what they do and are they going to be obsolete in a couple of years and things like that because one other thing about chips is they do become obsolete and if they do become obsolete you'll be redesigning and that could even be uh, one of the reasons why that little daughter board existed inside the unit it could be for literally uh, that, that purpose well I don't know about you but I, I like to make sure I know what is inside the unit just just in case there's some less than perfect equipment because nobody tells you do they nobody shows you do they but well, I'm going to I'm going to run through the devices on these pieces of paper not in any massive depth but just to talk about them a little bit so that you've got some idea of what you're dealing with and the first thing up as you can imagine I've got to read it because pages of this thing uh, is a 32-bit ARM Cortex. Now, the ARM Cortex is very, very common uh, in these types of devices. Most of the uh, sort of simulators and the rest, including the Tonex, uh, they've near enough all got this sort of ARM Cortex processor, but there are a lot of different ones. Now, upside on the screen is the Tonex one, and upside this side is the... Uh, the 32-bit ARM Cortex, it's an M4 slash MO MCU, microcontroller unit. It's up to a mega flash and 136 kilobytes of SRAM. It's got Ethernet on it, believe it or not. Two high-speed USBs, an LCD, and it's uh, EMC. Yeah, it's all there. I could go on more about it. I don't think I'll go through too many of these features. But uh, yeah, M4 processor core, ARM Cortex M4 processor running at a frequency of up to 204 MHz, by the way. It's built-in memory protection unit, an MPU, sporting eight regions indeed. Uh, it's an M4 built-in nested vectored interrupt controller. Now, I don't know what that is. I could sit here reading it, but I couldn't care less. Hardware floating point unit. There's a non-maskable interrupt NMI output, whatever that is. JTAG and serial wire debug. Enhanced trace module. System tick timer. It's got a Cortex M0 processor core. ARM Cortex processor capable of offloading the main ARM Cortex M4 application processor. Running on frequencies, as I've said, up to 204 and so on and so forth. On-chip memory. Serial GPIO, state configurable timer, uh, uh, and more. Oh, that's it. That's the main processor. And 
Scarily, uh, it costs all of £11.93 or its US dollar equivalent. Typically, where these are made, well, who knows what it costs, but if they buy in enough numbers of those chips, it will be cheaper than that. Hmm. Okay, well, now then, there is a second processor. Yeah, although it's more of an audio digital signal processor as opposed to the ARM Cortex that we spoke about just a few seconds ago. Now, this second one is an NXP DXP 56720. It costs approximately £20.29 pence if you buy relatively small numbers, but if you were to buy a lot, of course, that price comes down even further. But this 24-bit uh, dual-core Symphony DSP, uh, yeah, it's not recommended for new designs, it says here. So take of that what you will, but there it is. That's what it says. And uh, I've got a date on this, uh, this manual. I'm not sure I have. But I think this one's been around uh, some little while, yeah, which you should bear in mind. Anyway, its features include dual DSP 56300 cores for high performance. It's 284K times 24-bit words RAM. It's a synchronous sample rate converter, an ASRC, to allow multiple data rates in the system. It's got an integrated SPDIF transceiver to reduce system cost and complexity. There's an external memory controller, or EMC, uh, which provides for memory expansion for cost-effective SDRAM and flexibility in system design by providing memory expansion for one or both cores. There's an enhanced serial audio interface, which is comprising of four modules that allow multiple sources. The more you read it, the better it is. Dual serial host interface that supports SPI or I2C protocols, which provides high-speed communication between multiple of DSPs and other integrated circuits. There's a dual triple timer for the programmers. There's dual hardware watchdog timers to allow for recovery from runaway code. <laughs> well, i just seen it go out the door. <laughs> oh, my God. This product is included in NXP's product longevity program. Important. Yeah with assured supply for a minimum of 10 years after launch. The only problem is, I don't think it was launched particularly that recently. In fact, it wasn't. The PDF I'm looking at is 2009, February the 9th, 2009. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, you go do the math. But there it is. That's the second processor that this device depends on. Now, of course, we've got the ordinary, everyday sort of chips in this unit as well. And uh, the next thing up that I saw on that, uh, on that little motherboard, or should I say the daughter board with the main processor on, was uh, an Alliance AS4C8M16SA. And it's basically, it's 128 meg, dash 8 meg by 16 bit synchronous DRAM or SDRAM as we know it. It's fast access time of 5 stroke 5.4 nanoseconds, fast clock rate of 166 stroke 143 megahertz, fully synchronous, integral pipeline architecture, program mode registers, it's got loads of stuff in here, auto refresh and self refresh, 4096 refresh cycles per 64 milliseconds, go figure. <laughs> Uh, and loads of other stuff. I, I won't bore you too much with it. It's it, one two eight meg of SDRAM is a high speed seamless well, synchronous DRAM containing one hundred twenty eight megabits. It provides for programmable read or write burst lengths and so on and so forth. Yeah, there's two pages of it. I'm not going to bore you any more with it, except to say that this memory chip is one pound eighty six, or its equivalent in dollars. Uh, yeah, to buy one. And I found two in this unit. There might be more, there might not be. I might have missed them, but I could find two. Now, as you might have heard, you don't have to be technical to listen to all this. You might have heard, though, these magic words, ADC, or A to D, or DAC, or D to A. You might have heard those phrases. And it's analog to digital, 
or digital to analog, really. It's like a conversion chip, and these A to D and D to A chips are actually quite important that you get quite good ones in your system, because if you've got rubbish, well, you've got rubbish. And I'm pleased to say that this particular one comes from Cirrus Logic, an old friend that I used to know about that came from Richardson in Texas, near Dallas. Yeah, all very interesting stuff if you go and do a little bit of research on them. Of course, they're not the same people today. Uh, it's all moved on from being in Richardson in Dallas, or as near to Dallas as you can get, to uh, probably China, um, is my guess. Yeah, well, here it is. It's a CS42448 chip. It's uh, 108 decibels, 192 kilohertz, 6 in and 8 out codec. But it handles, actually, both things, A to D and D to A. Now, normally, when I'm looking at these, I normally find an A to D chip and then later a D to A chip. These, this has got two in one. I suppose it saves money in its own way. Uh, both for Cirrus Logic and for the maker, whoever that might be. In any case, the general consensus, the description is as follows, and some of this is actually, although it might be a bit meaningless, it's actually important that it's got a reasonably good chip in it. And I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that I've seen that. The CS42448 codec provides six multi-bit analog to digital and eight multi-bit digital to analog delta sigma converters. The codec is capable of operation with either differential or single-ended inputs and outputs in a 64-pin LQ FP package. That's just how it's made. You can see it on the screen. Six fully differential or single-ended inputs are available on stereo ADC1, ADC2, ADC3. Well, three times two makes six, of course. When operating in single-ended mode, an internal MUX or MUX before ADC3 allows selection for up to four single-ended inputs. Digital volume control is provided for each ADC channel with selectable overflow detection. Great for programmers. I mean, they... All eight DAC channels provide digital volume control and can operate with differential or single-ended outputs. An auxiliary seal input is available for additional two channels of PCM data. The CS42448 is available in a 64-pin LQ FP package in commercial temperatures, minus 10 to plus 70. An automotive even. You can, yeah, you can put this thing in cars. It's ideal for audio systems uh, requiring wide dynamic range. And let's face it, this you know, need a bit of dynamic range on it. Yeah, negligible distortion and low noise, such as AV receivers, DVD receivers, and automotive audio systems. There's a load more information on this thing. A load more. I won't go into any more depths with it, except to say that it costs about uh, eight to ten pounds, depending where you buy it from, and it's just one of them. Yeah, or oh, I could only find one of them. Let me rephrase that. Now, when I was looking through the uh, the Kemper player, I did actually see a Chinese piece of gear. Yeah, it got Chinese written all over it. In fact, yeah, it's up there now on the screen. And uh, yeah, well, what is it? Well, it's a wireless and Bluetooth module that they bought in to integrate into this unit. Rather than going and making one themselves, this is very common practice, by the way, people buy in the modules and dump them in their system. I've seen loads of them uh, from some of those other units that are down over there on the floor that I could name, uh, where you see these third-party devices. But this one is a Chinese, it looked Chinese to me at least. Well, let me read a bit to you about it. It's uh, interesting enough, if you could be bothered, if you're not bothered what's in it and it could break down in three weeks' time, don't bother with this section. <laughs> really? ESP32 WR over E and ESP32 W over IE are two powerful generic Wi-Fi and Bluetooth plus Bluetooth LE MCU modules that target a wide variety of applications. It ranges from low power sensor networks to the most demanding tasks such as voice encoding 
music streaming and MP3 decoding. I'll oh, fancy that. ESP32 WR over E comes with a PCB antenna and ESP WR over IE with a connector for an external antenna. So we've got the first one. The information on the datasheet is applicable to both modules. So what I say in one is equivalent to the other one, I guess. Yeah. Uh, two types of modules, as I said. And if you're looking at them, at the core of the module is the ESP32 Dowd V3 chip. Uh, this chip embeds and designed to, escape, to be scalable and adaptive. There are two CPU cores that can be individually controlled, by the way, and the CPU clock frequency is adjustable from 80 meg to 240 meg. So you can get a bit of speed going, man. <laughs> the chip also has a low-power coprocessor that can be used instead of the CPU to save power while performing tasks that don't require much computer power such as monitoring of peripherals. ESP32 integrates a rich set of peripherals ranging from capacitive touch sensors, SD card interface, Ethernet, high-speed SPI, UART, I2S and I2C. Well, a lot of those don't mean much to most people, but you've probably all heard of Ethernet. Hmm. It makes you wonder why it's all, all sort of there, because we spoke about Ethernet on one of the processors. Scarily, I don't see <laughs> I don't see anywhere on here an Ethernet connection. That might tell you something or not. Remember, Camper don't tell me anything, nothing. I, I don't really want them to. The integration of Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE and Wi-Fi ensures that a wide range of applications can be targeted and that the module is all around. Using Wi-Fi allows a large physical range and direct connection to the internet through a Wi-Fi router. While using Bluetooth allows the user to conveniently connect to a phone or broadcasting low energy beacons for its detection. The sleep current of the ESP32 chip is less than 5 microamps, making it suitable for battery powered and wearable electronics applications. The module supports a data rate of up to 150 megabits per second and 20 dBm output power at the antenna to ensure the widest physical range. As such, the module does offer industry-leading specifications and the best performance for electronic integration, range, power consumption and connectivity. Well, I could carry on with this again. Like I said, with most of these, I really could go on and on. But there's no point... What's worth knowing though, for something as complex and as good as that is, it costs, scarily, <laughs> £2.60 or a US dollar equivalent. Okay, well, I hope that was interesting about all the, the little chips that are inside there. And you know, you did see the quality of the device earlier on. And as far as I'm concerned, it's about as good as you get that is on quality. Uh, you're not going to get anything any better, even if you was to pay substantially more and some of the products that I've reviewed over the years have been substantially worse than what this one is. Isn't that right? You've seen them. Yeah. yeah. Now don't get too excited in this review, will you? We are going to have proper audio samples thrown through the, uh, the studio desk and the rest of it of this device. But remember, this is a player and not a uh, it won't make any new profiles, so it's not designed to do that. At least it's not designed to do that today. Who knows what Mr. Kemper and his band of merry men over in Germany could come up with. Um, there is rumour kicking around that, oh yeah, there could be extra features, and the extra features could cost you money. Well, if he does that, that's probably the first I've ever heard uh, since about 2012 of any simulator charging you extra, particularly from the manufacturer, uh, for extra features and things like that. Now, it could catch on, but my guess is, uh, coming from a, a sort of business sector where I've seen these add-ons and you try and charge a customer for them and the customer won't pay, no matter how much it is. They don't like that, customers. <laughs> and I'm the same, I wouldn't pay either, unless it's something extremely different for a, uh, well, just a player. When all said and done, it's just a player. You're up against the uh, tone X that can actually create profile. Well, I won't call them profiles. Tones, we'll call them tones. We'll call them that. So, 
Yeah, you're on a loser from start to finish there. And price matters, especially these days with all this inflation and everything else going on. Go figure. Yeah? Yeah. Would you pay $700? I wouldn't pay additional. Just, you wouldn't pay for, additional? Just for extra sounds. Well, they might not be sounds. They might be features. Well, you see, whatever. I'm talking of really extra features. That's what I'm trying to drive at. Well, whether he'll ever do that or not. Uh, I think it was on some uh, some internet forum. You know what they like, these internet boys. Yeah, I've got here in, in front of me, uh, yeah, the manual it comes with. You get four little feet, in case I've already covered it. I'm not going to harp on about that too much. And you get these two little manuals. You get a Kemper Profiler player manual, the prizes of... Lots of different languages and about two pages any use to you and me. Put that over there. And you also get a, a camper profile with player. Foot switches and cheat sheet. That's what I'd call it. Uh, yeah, it, it lets you register and you can set your Bluetooth up on it and things like that. Which you're going to want to do in the next section. So I'll put that over there too. I just wonder what happens if you lose it. <laughs> It won't have your details in the manual. And it won't have your details online in those manuals. You're going to have to, well, might, you might even have to get that from them if you lost this card. I don't know the answer. But do bear it in mind, won't you? It's fun you do lose your card. But the real manual, well, I decided to print it. Because I usually do print them, and the reason I print them is it gives you a bit of an indication into what's really going on with the unit. I can tell you that personally, in my view, they make good manuals. They're relatively simple. They run through all of the, the simple things and sometimes the less simple things. So uh, thumbs up to Kemper for doing all that. But... Like everything, these manuals are all hard work to go and print. And I think this is 160 pages, this particular Kemper uh, manual. Um, yeah, it's a bit of work to do it. In my opinion, you should do it. You don't have to. You want to save the trees and all the rest. Well, that's a great idea. But then it would have been a great idea to have an on and off switch on the unit, wouldn't it? That would have saved a few trees maybe as well. Go figure. I've also got down here on the table a few technical specifications, which I suppose I'll throw in for good measure, just because I should. It's uh, 2.68 inches high, it's 5.71 inches wide, and it's 6.53 inches deep depth. It, it weighs 2.45 pounds. I won't bother with all that European argy-bargy. We'll stick to pounds and... Yeah, pounds and ounces, yeah, and inches and things like that. I'm more for that. Its analog input is a quarter inch TS unbalanced dynamic range is greater than 108 dB and its impedance is 1 mega ohm. It's got analog outputs, main output XLR balanced, output level is plus 4 dBU, you should bear in mind because that's, uh, that's commercial standard. It's got monitor output, two quarter inch TS unbalanced output levels, which are again plus four dBU. Oh, wonder if they're switchable to minus 10. Oh. Headphone output, quarter inch TRS stereo, 32 to 600 ohms, 330 milliwatts at 32 ohms, 220 milliwatts at 600 ohms. So at least, hopefully, you can get some reasonably loud headphones going on it. It's got control and data interfaces, pedal input, quarter inch TRS for single dual switch or one expression pedal, 10 kilo ohms minimum, 100 kilo ohms maximum impedance for that pedal. The USB 2 uh, FS compatible device, USB type A and USB type B connections, which is what I did say. It's got USB MIDI being driven over that. USB audio, eight USB audio channels, with Windows and Mac OS at 44.1 kilohertz. Uh, the required minimum is Windows 10 version 1703, just for your information. I'd hate you to buy it and then you've got to send it back. 
or sell your PC. For the Wi-Fi, it's 2.4 gig WPA2 PSK, so it's a secure connectivity, which you can imagine it being at a gig and somebody <laughs> comes in on it. See, these things matter, don't they? Uh, they might not do unless you know that it's secure. Bluetooth, audio playback over Bluetooth. Electrical requirements, voltage 9 to 12 volts DC, 24 watts, plus outside, positive, let me get that right, positive outside, negative inside. It's environmental requirements. Temperature is between 41 degrees and 113 Fahrenheit, or 5 to 45 C. Non-operating temperature, if you live in a fridge, or you're an Eskimo, it's minus 20 to 47 C, and it's minus 4 to 116 F. It says here, non-operating temperature. I don't know what that's about. Relative humidity is 5% to 95%, non-condensing. I suppose these are all where it works. Maximum altitude, if you're going in the toilet on an aeroplane to do a bit of a gig. <laughs> 2,000 metres, that's 6,560 feet. So when you're at 38,000 feet, uh-oh, it won't work. Well, it might work, but it doesn't like it. And it's got FCC verification procedure approved, uh, the numbers pending. Funny enough, in this uh, little printout, it doesn't talk about CE approvals, which is uh, actually where Kemper comes from, Europe. Yeah, how weird's that? That's enough for them. It's got all that rubbish out of the way. <sighs> See, that's the trouble with people like him. He can't get the staff. He wants to work from home. Ah, oh, don't go there. And all that other good stuff that, well, staff do these days. I mean, he's been picking on me while the camera's been off. You know, he's insistent that it's the same as a Tonex. Well, I never said that. He's one of them that infers things like, I'm a bass player, but I play a great guitar. You've seen him, haven't you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, there's another one here. My old mate, Alan. Anyway, let's get on with it. So... Yeah, you might know that I like Kemper. And there's a good reason why I like Kemper. It's because they've got something like 22,000 different sounds. Yeah, and scarily, something I haven't talked about until now, but I'm going to, I'm going to weigh it all out, as they say. And if you go and have a look at the uh, Kemper Rig Manager and you search for Tony McKenzie, might be TonyMackenzieCarmore.com or something like that. You'll find the rigs that I actually uh, captured all those years ago in about, well, 2012, 13, 14, somewhere around there. And there's things like an Engel E670, which is a very rare amp because it was very expensive. Just been re-released, by the way. That's a German product. It's a brilliant product Horsebund as well. Horsebund Dirk Technic for them, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've also got on there, what else do I have on Splorn. there? Splorn. A Splorn, a Splorn Nitro. Now, anybody who hasn't heard one of them, you don't know what you're missing. And Mr. Splorn, yes, there is one, still makes them over in America, and he can make one for you. And uh, I'll put a link down in the text so you can go to Splorn Amps. I think it's SplornAmps.com. But don't, don't quote me, it's in the text. Always have a look in my videos for... All the things in the text that are sort of associated. And I can tell you, if you go and download those profiles of mine, and people have taken them and tried to change them away from me, oh, this is my profile type of thing, uh, which you do get from time to time. Uh, but it's, you can still tell whose it is, really. <laughs> That's what I'd say. So those sort of things make this rather better than some of the other products that are out there. So what do you think? Do you think the Tonex thing? Well, I know you had a lot of fiddling with it when you had oh, one. I did. And uh, mm. trying to get it to talk to the internet was a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. I had a trouble trying to get it to talk to anything, actually. It had a, <laughs> the Tonex, just as a, a, a deviation for a second, because it does matter. The Tonex had a problem that had existed for two years before I got the Tonex in the software that was driving the Tonex. 
So you couldn't actually register the Tonex device. So therefore you couldn't download the other software and on and on and on. And I, I checked this back out over the internet. And it, that problem had been going on with IK Multimedia from what I saw for about two years. And well, clearly when I looked at the Tonex, they hadn't solved it even then. And that wasn't that long ago, probably nine months or so, I don't know, something like that. But when you come back to Kemper, software problems is not something you get. You see, something important about Kemper. What's important about Kemper is this. When they make the software, it works. Yeah, it works every time. Every time. I haven't loaded the software for this onto that device over there yet. But I can tell you now, before I do, it's going to go on and it's going to work first and go pretty much like Roland and Boss software does. And when I come back to companies like, uh, that make things like the Tonex pedal, and it's got problems, or it had problems for me, that's what matters when I'm reviewing, I'll tell you the way it was. When I have problems like that, I always think about the poor guy that buys it, who has no way of getting past it. He's stuck, and um, thanks very much. Because I contacted, uh, yeah, IK Multimedia, and about a week later, I got half an answer. Then they wonder why they don't get 10 out of 10 as a score. Well, those are exactly the reasons. Campus support has always been pretty good. And uh, I've had an account personally for 12 years uh, or more on the Kemper uh, support site. Yeah, very interesting. Sport matters. It always matters. And, you know, when, <laughs> when I look at some of the other products where the support is absolutely dire uh, and can be very, very... Uh, you're having to deal with some nasty people. Uh, those companies, the best thing to do with them companies is don't buy anything from them. Well, Kemper isn't like that, and uh, in my experience, they've always been pretty good. I've hardly had any problems anyway. One thing before we move on, uh, I just want to point out, actually, that I did actually go and buy this with my own money. Kemper doesn't uh, sponsor me in any way whatsoever. In fact, they probably wish I wasn't around, but that's life. I'm still a customer, a paying customer. And the review here is my personal opinion and uh, comments from my experience, both with the Kemper amp and with this pedal. So I want that to be perfectly clear. It's not a paid for uh, review. Review, yeah. Okay, well, moving on, what we're going to do is we're going to fetch up some of the software and connect to this device and let you take a look. And, uh, you know, the rig manager alone is... Uh, uh, it's entertaining stuff and if you want to sit in front of something longer than you could on a fractal audio this is the device and so is the camper with probably uh, I haven't been on looked of recent times but I think there's 22 or 23,000 <laughs> profiles for you to thumb through over the next six months to find your six good ones <laughs> they'll probably be mine so just search for me <laughs> anyway here's the software uh, we've got a screen capture of it, and uh, yeah, I'm not getting into the ultimate depth. I just want to show you the basic features and advantages of buying a camper over a Tonex. And mark my words, this eats the Tonex for breakfast, whether it can capture or not. Okay, well, here we are inside Rig Manager. This is 3.5.15, profile release 10.9.3. 50342, which I think is somewhat to do with mine. But <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about that. This is the basic sort of uh, layout that you have. And you have, look, you're starting over this side, I think. If you have a look at this, we've got 21,709 rigs. And you know something, I'll tell you something right now. That's why this is a better device than the Tone X. Right from the off, there's no ifs, no buts, no ors. This has been actually working with profiles. Let's go back a little while. Scarily, since the 10th of December 2010. And you can see right there, there's no making it up by Tony or 
anything else. Here they are, all, they all start off pretty bad. And then they got be better and better and better and better. And there are 21,709 profiles that you can put into your device, right? You haven't got to go and start profiling or capturing as the, you, you do with the Tonex and uh, best of luck with that software. Having said that, most software can be variable depending on what you're running it on, I guess. But I never actually made the Tonex software uh, install in any easy way. It was a nightmare. This one, well, I wouldn't call it simple because when you're installing this software, although you might or might not have seen it to date, it actually, among other things, turns off your internet connection on your PC. It uh, turns off the mouse for Bluetooth and... Uh, things like that and uh, yeah turned off the wi-fi and there's more we'll come to it so looking around the unit uh well looking around the uh, the rig manager this is a very useful piece of software and it, it hasn't always been around and it wasn't around for year after year there were loads of people actually trying to simulate or make uh, software that could do it but none of them were really very successful and Kemper I don't know why but they, they, they appeared to have sort of deaf ears at the time uh, and, and sometimes you do get that from companies you know because it does have a cost to make it so let's uh, let's come back to it like I said we've got uh, across the top here we've got a menu of a number of things let's get them out of the way uh, you can import rigs or import Impulse responses, something on the early uh, Kemper equipment you could never do. That, that wasn't part of the deal, so to speak. You can also export rigs. You can open a profile or backup to pull it back in or that sort of thing. You've got a preferences tab. If we have a quick look on that. Well, this is where you log in, test your login and all the rest. And uh, yeah, what more can I say about that? Well, there might be something else to say. Let's have a look general owner me <laughs> who knows the owner's name is used to identify contents you create well that's not how i tend to have it i tend to have it as tony mckenzie.com as you will find out okay so that's that one out of the way let's have a look at edit but i'm not really going to do that much I can select all, or I can find an individual uh, profile. Um, we'll have a look at some of that. Got some tools here. Revert profile at OS2 release version. So if you put a, a, a beta copy on there, well, sometimes they screw up. And they can screw up badly. That's why they're called beta copies. So you can get it back to a, a real release version. We can export the tags to a CSV file, which you could pull into either a database or a spreadsheet or anything you fancy that's, that can handle CSV files. And there are millions of programs that can do that. Very common uh, export format. Backup rig manager content or restore rig manager content. Self-explanatory. I'm not going to bore you with it, although I have already done it. We can open a new window. We can open an editor. We can close the editor. So close the editor, you just get Basically, you just get the profiles and you could be here and I could be here for, well, <laughs> days. Well, that's not going to happen. Uh, so we'll leave the editor open. Uh, nothing else on there. Very little on there. We're in the all rig section. And we've got some various help sections online and that sort of thing. But I don't bore you with any of that. Now... If you look at this, you can, you can actually search for particular profiles. And you saw what I called mine uh, not long ago. And uh, I was doing that actually in 2012. So I can search in here for TonyMcKenzie.com, which is, by the way, the same name as my website. And uh, I've got information on my website about lots of things. I think Kemp is in there somewhere. So you can have a look here. Uh, and press enter and uh, yeah there should be some in there see what happens with these is 
you can see them all down here. And you've got these different people that are saying, well, they're this, they're that, they're the other. But in reality, if they do actually associate to TonyMcKenzie.com, they're actually either mine or some people have taken them and used them in other ways. I've got local profiles on here, rather than going through the 21,700. <laughs> if we click on there, here's the profiles I've got. Uh, they show the various gains and the, the unit name, when it was done, the author, favourites, are they ticked or not? Well, not on this software, they're not, because this isn't normally the software that I use. This is software that's, well, it's really uh, just showing you. What I, I think is a bit of a shortcoming, and I could be wrong on this because I haven't been into this software before, but I don't see the same ratings in here as I do when I look on uh, Rig Manager on the internet. Uh, and on the internet, they're all five star or four star or whatever. Now, I know most of mine uh, were five star or four star, so which means they were pretty good, really. And that's one of the reasons we're going to be pulling them down into uh, this profile of player today. But I just wanted to show you them. There's the example. You'll notice they're all 2012 because I don't like sitting here all day. Well, frankly, giving away uh, my amp tones <laughs> and devaluing the amp companies because that's, that's an opinion that I have. Uh, but there it is. There they are. There's a few on there and I never went back and put any more on. So let's have a look. Uh, let's choose one. If you click it and wait, you'll notice that this change down here. And... They're pretty basic, these are, because they go all the way back to the February 2012. We can look at the system. Foot switches, things that are turned on or not turned on. And yeah, well, you won't find much turned on because I tend not to do that sort of stuff. You can go down here, per individual uh, profile, by the way, and set all of these various things. For your own, uh, you know, for your own benefit, per profile, that seems. We'll go back to the rig. You notice it's slightly, uh, it's slightly slow too. Yeah, there's the rig. There's looking at inputs, noise gates, and clean sensing, things like that. This is empty. Well, it would be. Choose an effects type first. Well, yeah. Here we go. Choose them down here. Let's choose. Uh, I don't know, uh, a chorus. And if we choose chorus, we've got a number of choruses. But, you know, people don't always relate to Kemper and uh, effects. But the Kemper player has got a couple of effect sets, or settings, should I say. The, the Kemper itself has got, obviously, more. Um, you know, they never really talk much about effects uh, on the camper stuff, or they never did. And I think it's a bit of a shortcoming because there's nothing wrong with the camper effects, although some people say there is. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Probably them Tonex boys. What do you think, Al? All that other big American company. Yeah, so, so if we put one in there, we take a chorus and a vintage chorus and we do that. The vintage chorus is now there, and here's the controls for it. Very simple. Here's another one. Please choose another effect. Well, we could choose another one. Fact is, really, I don't really want to put anything in them. How do I get rid of it? Oh, it's disabled. Well, that'll do. <laughs> we've got the amp itself, haven't we? Yeah. So we've got some controls, and you'll notice they're all set exactly 12 o'clock. So they haven't changed anything to do with uh, how I originally recorded the product. Yeah, quite interesting. The cabinet, is there a cabinet? The cabinet is off. Well, it would be off because back in the day, you didn't record the cabinet. You recorded the amp from uh, what I could see. I never really did see any more. But you could add cabinets in there, including all of these. But of course, you can import 
uh, what ails you want, whatever you fancy. Yeah, if you want to be like that, that'd be uh, all quite good. Unless you want to just do the output back through another amp, <laughs> which I guess you could do too. And I'll be showing you my uh, setup in the other room uh, of how we uh, we use this uh, with an amp. A bit later. We've got legacy delay. Well, it would be. <laughs> I did have a delay on it at the time, I think. <laughs> I've been asleep. Uh, legacy reverb. Here they are. Yeah. And we've got, where's it going for the outputs? We can choose various places. What they are. These are the cones. Full range. Speakers. Blah, 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 blah. So there's lots of choices to go and make and mess around with. Now, listen, I'm not going to take you through all of this stuff. I could be here forever. I, I like these things like this. When you, when you click this, if we uh, look over here, you get a bit, a bit of an idea of what it's all about. See, configuration 4x12. Well, that 4x12 was an angle cab, an angle pro cab. I remember right. Uh, so you've got all this information all about this profile, which is quite nice. And I, I guess if we go back to all rigs, eventually, and look at some of the newest ones, I can whip back to be in today. Look at one of them. We've clicked it. It's varied down the bottom here. It's changed, of course. And we can see some of the things over this side of what the guy's used or what he hasn't used. Uh, again, all very interesting. We can change so much. What's this do? Undo all rig changes, copy or rename the rig. Oh, it goes, does that take you to the side? No, it's just for show. I see that. <laughs> so you get a bit of an overall idea of what this is all about. It's not a training video, clearly. It's just a question of showing you all these features and uh, things that you can apply, really, to the profiler player uh, and the uh, profiles themselves. It's, it's almost endless, if you want the truth. And uh, they should sound quite good. Well, I'm pretty sure they will. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and load up the uh, profiler player with my tones, I don't care about all the rest because every man, every man that's been given one for free or whatever their story is, will be showing you all of that. Uh, but they won't be showing you mine, so I think it's a good idea to show you some of mine uh, that were generated back in 2012 even. Remember that. And if you think that 2012 profiles, well, then will be crap. Nobody wants them. I think you could be wrong. Uh, so... Yeah, when we get to hear it a bit later on, we'll name the profiles and, uh, yeah, you can have a listen to them. And you make your own mind up. What do you say, Al? Sounds like a winner to me. He says it's like a winner. He goes very quiet sometimes. Have you ever noticed? It's like having a pet dog. I mean... <laughs> I perhaps nodded off. <laughs> oh, you nodded off. He's nodded off. Hey, you're still there, aren't you? <laughs> okay. Well, he that's, nodded off as well. That's it for now uh, on this section. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I hope you've liked it so far. So I'm installing Rig Manager on this thing. You can see it whipping around there. It's all fun. Isn't it, Al? It could be described as fun. It could be described as fun, especially on a, on a Sunday when it's in England freezing cold. Yeah, we've got a heater, but uh, it breathes fire, doesn't it? <laughs> it's open, it says here. I say open. I've opened it. Searching. Rig manager would like to find and connect to devices. You can see it, can't you? We've got to look. Okay, let's do that. Searching for profiles. Well, there's one there right next to it. How does that sound? Yeah, you can see it with your own eyes. Start in demo mode. Or st oh, no, it's still searching. So my guess is that's network. We'll go back to networks if you like. I mean, we could, we could do this all day. Oh, yeah, there it is. Join it. Quick. Fancy that. Or not. Weak security. Well, it doesn't ask me for a password yet. 
So let's go back to uh, that one. You are. Connect. Well, funny enough, I didn't use any passwords. Did you notice that? I did. Has it connected? So it's connected now. Yeah, make sure you get it right up there, won't you? Because if you don't, it will be like what I had. Engel E670, SE Lead 2. And I can see that that actually... I go to 1 to 1. That is my tone. So I can go through the tones, even without pressing the buttons. Show me this thing works. Yeah, well, that's okay. We got there in the end, didn't we, Al? Mm. So what if your battery runs up? <laughs> Anyway, enough of this frivolousness. Always take a charge. Yeah. Okay, well, where have I been? <laughs> to you, I've been five seconds. To me, I've had a week of hell fixing a, uh, an M2 uh, SSD in the main PC for editing and all the rest of it. And uh, yeah, that proved to be very, very difficult, particularly with the editing software that I have where it doesn't actually back up the editing software's database. It backs up different things. Needless to say, nightmare. Been there, done that. Few more bits and pieces to be going on with here. If you think about the, uh, the profile of player, if you sit and think about it, who's it for? Is it for guitarists? Probably. Is it for bass guys? Well, it can support gate bass guys. Yeah, believe it or not, it can. What about keyboard players? You know, them dudes. Yeah, it does that too. It's good for, well, almost everything. But did you know it also is great for acoustic guitarists? Yeah. Guys who like vintage amps. And I do know that going all the way back to the, uh, to the camper in 2012, some of those tones back then were awesome. And, well, actually, they remain awesome now. I'm not sure whether I've covered some of this because I've been out of this for, <laughs> for a while, but take heed of this stuff. Metal guys all love it, but it isn't just for metal guys. It's for really almost anybody. Almost, you could almost put anything in it, and that's a great thing. So what about warranty with Kemper? That could be a sticky solution. Well, in reality, it's not. This thing's got probably about a three-year warranty which is not bad really. It's got uh, good support. I've covered support before a little bit earlier in the video. If you go onto their online forum, you'll find that uh, the guys in general on there are not like the guys on Fractal Audio. <laughs> yeah, the guys on Kemper are generally nice guys. Yeah, now isn't that a surprise? Isn't that a change? Now I do want to cover buying this thing from Germany if you're based in the UK. You knew I would somehow, didn't you? If you don't want to buy it from the uh, music resellers, we'll call them that. I don't like to use the other word because YouTube thinks I sell things. <laughs> yeah, so you can buy this thing direct from Germany. And it took me about, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks, couple and a half weeks, something like that to get all of it. And I do know on the site at the moment, on the Kemper site, that is, uh, I think it's quoting three weeks delivery. So they've got a backlog of these things. And yeah, it's understandable. So what would I have to say about this, this product that I could even go and talk about? Well, we could talk about, uh, I don't know, service and support, but that's always been good. I've talked a little bit earlier about that. I think it's time to give it a score. Yeah, that all makes sense. So Tony, what score would you give it? I mean, you've got to be fair to the unit. I am an owner of an earlier camper, and I like that. It's still going in there. It's a rack version and, you know, that sort of stuff. But this is built pretty well, and it's, it's got some reasonable stuff in it, if uh, not the fastest processor in the world. But that's another story. Maybe for another time or not. It seems to do the job for what it's designed for. Yeah. The only thing is, as always with things like uh, chips, is to uh, watch the longevity of the chip. You know, if they stop making them well, they stop making this in effect. However, I'm going to give it a score of 10 out of 10. It is good. And it's certainly a long way better, in my opinion, 
Then the Tonex. The Tonex is like a... Well, a Tonex is a bit like a Mini, and this is a bit more like a Rolls Royce. Oh, sorry, a Mercedes. But even with the 10 out of 10, there are a number of problems, a number of different things that I've found working my way through the review so far. Because remember, it's a real review and I did buy it. But I'll just name a few. <laughs> They're just things I found as I was going. The connections on the back for the USB are not always perfectly clear on, on the manual. Uh, they don't say, oh, it's this connection goes to there or this one goes to... They say USB, but they don't say which one. Hmm, that's a point. When I connected the PC that had a perfectly good working mouse and Wi-Fi, and I turned this on, <laughs> it appeared to turn off those items on the PC or affect them so they didn't work. Who knows? Obviously, I did fix it, but it's just a bit of a weird one, that. Another point is, when you're in Rig Manager and you're loading the rigs for the first time, do bear in mind that it can take sort of 15 minutes or thereabouts, or maybe longer, depending on your connection. I have a, 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 a one gig connection in here, and uh, yeah, it still took 15 minutes. So clearly, it wasn't at my end, it's the other end, wherever them are stored. Another thing about Rig Manager, uh, whether I covered it or not earlier, doesn't matter, but... You have ratings for every uh, profile when you go and look at it online. But those ratings didn't appear to transpose across into the rig manager on the laptop. And I thought that was a bit weird. <laughs> You've got to sort of go backwards and forwards looking for what you really want. Maybe it's my gear. Somehow I doubt that. One of the other things in rig manager uh, that I noticed you may or may not have in the demo, it might have been cut out, is that sometimes, uh, I made a note down here, it said it wouldn't copy and paste. I did several attempts to do that, and then it did copy. <laughs> really, again, they're the just funnies that I noticed along the route. I was also happy with the power supply. I'm happy with all of this, really. It works. So, uh, yeah, I've loaded my profiles into this thing all the way back from 2012. Great. We'll see what happens with that. That should be interesting. Well, before we go any further, I just want to show you uh, how I would connect this up in here uh, if I was wanting to record it through speakers and things like that, which you might or might not. Here we go. The Kemper Rack. And down below it, I've got this uh, this amplifier here. It's not the newest of things. This one's a, a matrix element. And uh, yeah, it's a stereo one. But you could use one side, I guess, to plug that in. Yeah, I haven't got there with it yet. But I will. Maybe not on this video, but who knows. There's the unit. There's the thing I put it in and off to the speakers from that and then you don't need to faff around with IRs or well, maybe you do <laughs> we shall see but for now that's what's going to happen uh, when I want speakers I use that yeah just as I do with this thing above it and uh, yeah it's the easy way out but of course this time uh, I might do something different but if I do I'll show you and of course if you don't want any of that faffing around with IRs and cabs and all the rest of it well you could, because I know you could, you could go get one of these, couldn't you? One of these blue box speaker emulators with all these speakers in it, which is the easy way out, I guess, rather than all that faffing. Problem is with faffing around is a lot of people don't like faffing around. They plug an amp in and it just works. Well, in this case, sometimes it doesn't just work. You've got to go tweaking around for hours on end. That's not something I particularly like to do, and I'm sure that a lot of guys don't. So that's one of the answers that you could apply to the camper profiler. Yeah, player. Well, scarily, if you go back far enough, uh, you could even use one of them things, couldn't you? Are these all obsolete these days? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> it's just I have these lying around all over the place these different sorts of uh, speaker emulators hmm obsolete out of it maybe not hey you yeah you 
You have subscribed, haven't you? What do you mean you haven't subscribed? You haven't done the thumbs up thing and you you didn't click all for notifications. Well, you don't have to click all, but, uh, but you should turn the notifications on. Then at least you've got an idea when the next mega review is coming up uh, from me that's an inside and outside review. Now, they're not all inside and outside reviews, but, you know, these thumbs up, the subscriptions and all the rest of it, all contribute to me actually making videos. I'm not really that much bothered about the money side of things, but it's good to have when it costs me money to go and pay. You know, I have to buy these different devices. In fact, the whole place is full of them. So come on, let's see you subscribe. I'm not a particularly nasty type of uh, reviewer, and most of the reviews, including this one, this has been bought, uh, are paid for, uh, not by other people, but they're paid for by me. Yeah, I go and buy the equipment. That makes a huge difference, no matter what any of those boys will tell you. Buying the equipment, using it, and having an unbiased review makes really worth the subscription, honestly. Otherwise, you don't know what you're really buying. You just think you do. Okay, well, just before we get to the plane, I just want to list some of the uh, profiles that I uh, that I used, and they're in order on this from one upwards. And what are the profiles? Well, I've got to read them to you. They're down here. It's been a while since I looked at uh, my profiles. But anyway, what we've got is an, e an Engel E670 Lead 1, an Engel E670 SE Lead Tony McKenzie. We've got an Engel E670 SE Lead 2. We've got an Engel E670, which is probably just clean, maybe. JVM 410 HJS, clean. We've got uh, JVM 410 HJS Crunch Red. We've got JVM 410 HJS Overdrive 1 in red. And a JVM 410 HJS Overdrive uh, 1 in red, not shifted. We've got a Dumble clone uh, LW Dumble HRM ST. We've got a Marshall YJM100 in crunch. We've got a Marshall YJM100 lead. Yeah, I, I'm sort of winding you over, aren't I? <laughs> Not to worry. And we've got a, a Marshall JTM45 in clean. And a J, JTM45 flat out. I, I did actually capture it with that. Yeah, which is fun. I've got a Mesa Road King 2 on Channel 3 Vintage, which is one of my favourite lead uh, tones for a long time. Uh, yeah, really good. We've got a, a Mesa Road King 2 Channel 4 Modern. Mesa Road King 2 Clean. Mo Mesa Road King 2 Crunch. I've got a Spawn Nitro that's clean, that's also crunch, that's also heavy. And that's where I stop, really. That's all I'm going to do. That's, uh, I think that's about 20. Uh, yeah, it's about 20, that is all in. But you should get an idea of the tones. Now, whether I play something uh, with backing tracks and things or not, well, that just depends on the time because I've already run out of time on this one, uh, this, this review, with the PC problem. But that's what's coming up, uh, and I, I wanted to get that across so that uh, you've got an idea, not of somebody else's tones, or not of what is in there by default. Anybody can do that, can't they? Uh, but I, I, I think it's better to have a listen at some tones that, at the time, uh, I generated way back in 2012, as I said. But most of those are either four or five stars, and uh, yeah, that says a lot when they've been on there since 2012. Anyway, on to the playing. Ah, there you are. Well, here we are in the uh, the sort of control room, as it were, and I've got my uh, phone here connected to the Kemper Profiler Player, that's its real name, and yeah, I can get at all the various uh, presets or should I say profiles that I actually stored in <laughs> January 2012 believe it or not well they're on the screen now and the reason they're on the screen now 
basically it's very simple it's because those are what we're going to run through quickly i'm not going to spend forever going through presets but very quickly uh to let you have a listen at them and i think that uh that makes sense doesn't it okay this track's going to be uh a track called uh White Pipe AI that I, uh, I wrote on an album called ENIAC many years ago and uh, it's a very powerful track and uh, yeah you can swing up and down a bit with this one yeah so it's a, it's not an easy track for me to play but it's got a lot of power in it for me it might not have for you but it has for me so here goes Okay, so this is the camper as it stands. It's actually set on a different preset. We're going to start at the beginning and work our way through. But I've actually got two wires coming out, uh, out of the monitor outs, and I've got the guitar in. Well, the, where the guitar goes in, I've got the... I'm actually using a Rowan power supply, by the way. So all these settings, uh, to be honest, haven't been changed or are not going to be changed at all they all sit exactly where they did well when i collected the uh, profile at the time and you might find uh, well you will find that there will be some uh, irs in there some speaker simulator uh, you know irs uh, attached to the tone but uh, if they're worth bothering with i'll show you what they are and if they're not worth bothering with i won't that's, it's that simple so that's that's the sort of layout of what we've got kicking around and it's all pretty simple it's pretty straightforward it's plug in and go and if somebody wants to say to me oh you can't do that through the monitors well it seems to work for me hmm. probably work for you too it's connected as well as you can see to the phone that's just at the side over there so not all connected perfect by the way 
Uh, not like some of the other gear I've seen kicking around. So that's another plus for, uh, really, for Kemper. Whereas the Tonex, uh, well, yeah, even after a week, it did, didn't solve the problem. that It was already two years old regarding connections and authorizations, which says a lot to me. Anyway, enough of that for now. And one of the things I do have uh, is a track that I uh, wrote way back in about 2000 and something. <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is called Tumble T. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but that's a big 48 inch screen behind the recording desk. And that's what we, we tend to use because it's a sort of foot or two behind, you know. We need to be able to see things in here. Yeah, so there's Tumble T, there's the track. And uh, yeah, interesting couple of points. Uh, you'll be able to listen to it as we go, which will be coming out the device and going through the desk and getting recorded and blah blah blah. Now the thing about Tumble T, it's got one of those amps on that was you know captured at the time with the real camper in the other room and uh, we can turn everything off except maybe the the drums, the bass guitar and that all important rhythm because it's a sort of heavy sort of track and you can be able to compare that yourself whether it's the same or it's different frankly to be honest i don't even remember exactly which amp i used i think uh it was the angle And if you want to download those uh, profiles yourself, well, they're on there. You just search for the owner as being TonyMcKenzie.com and down they come. Yeah, you can get my actual profiles from all them years back. And uh, if you think they're not uh, really that good, they were actually four and five stars on, uh, on Kemper. Okay, this one's going to be the... Uh... The Engel E670 SE lead, but the TM version, which was my lead guitar version. Wow. 
Well, this next one I'm not going to hop on too much about because it's just the. It's the same one, it's the E670 SE Weed 2. is a, a JVM 410H and that's a HJS, the Joe Satriani one and he has a, a particularly clean channel, the Green Queen channel <laughs> This is the uh, JVM 410H again, but of course this is the, uh, it's the Rhythm Red Channel. This is OD1 red with a shift in. It's exactly the same as the last one, but without the shift. JM100 lead and uh, yeah it definitely is and uh, I can't play Ving Vey stuff so don't even ask me to try I'll just play some lead on the thing and uh, yeah just see what you think <laughs> This next 
next one is the uh, Mesa Road King 2 Channel 3 Vintage and that's what I tended to use for lead guitar. <laughs> It is the uh, Mesa Road King 2, uh, Channel 4, Modern. out so uh, I'm on the last two now very so sorry for that but I could be here forever I don't want the spare time so this next one's going to be uh, this is a spawn nitro in, in its crunch channel and mark my words if you play metal or anything like that spawn nitro can do it uh, in, in spades honestly it has such a, a brilliant uh, tone uh, but I don't know many amps like it honestly I don't one I'm going to do. This is the Spawn Nitro, once again, but this is in its heavy mode. And believe me, if you thought the last one was sort of heavy, well, this one's even more heavy, if there could be a thing. And uh, brilliant amp. I, I, I can't ever stress that. If you get hold of a Spawn Nitro, or you see one cheap, just grab it. <laughs> Thank you. 